we're going to be doing 1920 by 1080, 24 frames. And then let's just do 10 seconds for tonight. So, you know, motion design, and I'll say it again. It's first think about what you want to do, then think about how you're going to do it. And lastly, you know, follow the workflow. So here's what we're going to do for a refresher. I have a rectangle and I want it to look like I'm pulling down a window shade. What's the first step that I'd need to do? The anchor point. Exactly. I use the pan behind tool and I move my anchor point. So if I want this to look like I'm pulling down a window shade, where should I put the anchor point? At the bottom? No, I want it to look like I'm pulling down on a window shade. The top middle. Yes, exactly. Top middle. And remember, if you hold down control or command, you can snap it to an edge, a center, a corner. All right, so I've set my anchor point. Now, what's the next thing that I need to do? Before I set the first keyframe, there's one more step. I move the playhead to where I want to start animating. So let's say I want to start here. Now I click on the stopwatch. So if I want this to look like a window shade is being pulled down, what stopwatch should I click on? Yeah, scale. So I click on scale. Now, if I want this to look like a window shade is being pulled down, am I going to uniformly or non-uniformly scale it? Non-uniformly. Exactly, non-uniform, because we're only animating the Y, the down. So here's our first keyframe. We turned off non-uniform, and I'm going to set this to zero. Now, what's my next step? Move the to where you want it to. Exactly, the playhead. Mm -hmm. Move the playhead. All right, good. Now, what's my next step? Scale it up. Exactly. So I can make this whatever amount I want to be. So if that's how long I want my window shade to be, fine. So now I can preview it. I'm just going to shrink my render area. And there's our motion. Now, this is too even. I want something more custom. What should I do? The graph editor thing? Yep. So I select my keyframes, and then I do what? Uh, right click one of the. Exactly. Right click. You're on a Mac. Okay, so I I held down the control key and now I've got a right click. Okay, so what should I choose? Easy ease. Exactly. Now I can go into my graph editor. Someone cannot find their anchor point. If you cannot find your anchor point, here's a little cheat. There's mine, but if you can't see it, if you hold down command or control and you double click on the pan behind, it'll snap the anchor point to the middle of that layer. At least then you'll be able to find it. Did that work for you? Okie doke. So I'm just gonna click on the word scale to select my keyframes and go into my graph editor. Now this looks like the value graph to me. Let's see if I'm right. Yeah, it's the value graph. The button next to the eyeball, that's where you can change between speed and value. The value is how much is happening and the speed is how fast it's happening. I'm gonna click right here to enlarge my graph. Now remember, don't move the yellow squares up or down. That'll change the amount of what's happening. In this case, the amount of scaling. We're gonna use the influence handle. Okay, I'm gonna slow out of this because I want it to start slower because no one just yanks on the window sheet. So that's a little bit better. And then it just gradually comes to a nice smooth stop. So I'm happy with that. And I just click out of my graph editor. Okay, so that was a recap of the basics of every day. Think about, what, I mean, motion. Think about what you want to do. Figure out how you're going to do it. Move your anchor point. Move the playhead. Click whatever member, number of stopwatches. Move the playhead back or forward. And then make your changes. Everyone good with that? All right. So. I'm gonna hide the shape, make a square. And I'm gonna put, well, I'm not gonna move my anchor point yet. Now, easy easing the keyframes is one of the 12 principles of motion design called slow out, slow in. You're slowing out of the first keyframe, slowing into the second one. Who can remember another one of the 12 principles of animation we covered last week? I'll give you a hint. We did it with the bouncing ball. 
stretch and squash. Exactly. Squash and stretch. Now, if I want this to make it look like it's impacting on the ground, where should I put my anchor point? At the bottom. Exactly. At the bottom. So I hold down command and I snap it there. Okay. Who can tell me what stretch is? Like what directions do I go for stretch? I'm going to non-uniformly scale this. When we stretch, we go up. And what's the other direction? You want to keep the volume. So if it got taller, it's going to need to get thinner. Stretch, it gets thinner. So if I added 60 here, I subtract 60 from here. So it's going to be 40. That's what stretch would look like. And if I were to do squash, which way would this go? Squash is down and out. So if I add 50, if I take 50 here, I add 50 here. Keeping my volume down and out is squash. Up and in is stretch. Okay. Does anyone remember another one of the 12 principles of animation we covered last week? We talked about it with uh, Sarah's tape rotating. We did overshoot. So her tape rotated. Let's say it went up like this. Oh, you know what? That's the wrong anchor point. I'm going to move it to the bottom right, the bottom corner right here. So her tape rotated up. Now the overshoot really should happen on the ground. So overshoot would look like this. It'd go to zero. And overshoot would be going above and below. Since it can't go below the ground, I would go set my rotation, wait for it to go down, go to zero where it hits the ground. And then a little bit past that, I'd go up a little bit more. So if that's six, then I go back to zero because it can't go below the ground. So if the other one was six, I'll do four. So it'll be minus four this time. Go back to zero where it hits the ground. Then you see my keyframes are getting closer and closer as the distance gets smaller and smaller because it's moving a little quicker. So let's see what that looks like. Let me ease that. And let's find out. And there you have that little bit of overshoot as it's tapping against the ground on impact. Does anybody remember the last of the 12 principles of animation we covered last week? So when I was talking about throwing a punch or throwing a baseball or Superman getting ready to fly, no one, okay. That is anticipation. And anticipation is just going in the opposite motion of the main action. So if this star is gonna go across the screen, the anticipation of that, I'd move forward a little bit. I'd have it move back a little bit to set up the viewer's eye. Let me show that up and then move it. So it looked like go back a little bit. That's overshoot. I'm not overshoot, that's anticipation. Setting up the action by going in the opposite direction or doing the opposite action really. All right, any questions on any of that stuff? No, okay. Now, I'm going to add a new one of the 12 principles of animation in. And that is, which one was I doing tonight? Let me think. Oh yeah, follow through an overlapping action. What that would be is, let's pretend I've got a hat. We'll say that's the hat, okay? And on that hat is a feather. So I can make that a different color. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay, so let me label these. Okay, I just hit enter to, to name these. 
So here's the way it goes. Follow through and overlapping action would look like this. So first, I'm going to parent the feather to the hat. Well, actually, even before I do that, I got to set my anchor point. My anchor point will be down here where it meets the hat. And for my hat, let's put the anchor point at the bottom middle. Okay. So parenting, I showed you loosely last week, but that's when whatever you do to one object will do to whatever's parented to it. So I can grab this pick whip and go from the feather to the hat, or I could use the drop down. What that means is if I move this hat, the feather moves with it, okay? So this is going to save me a ton of keyframing. So I'm going to have the hat move forward across the screen a little bit. So I'm going to go from here and have it stop there. Okay, so here's the hat. There's our motion. Let me speed that up. That's too slow. There's our motion, okay? Well, I want to give more life to this. So what I'm going to do is where the impact stops, I'm going to add a little bit of rotation. So we will click my rotation, go forward a little bit, have it tip down, and then set up some overshoot where it goes back a little past it, and then stop at zero where it was. So let's take a look at that. Let me ease this. See, there's a little bit of a jostle. Okay, so that's our motion. Here's some overlap, here's some follow, I mean, some uh, now, follow through and overlapping action would be this. Once the hat stops moving, the feather would keep moving because it's further from the hat. So I'm gonna give some rotation to that. I'm gonna move this. Just past that. So the hat would stop, then the feather would move. Now it's gonna bob forward. And since it's bobbing forward, the feather's gonna go a little bit more forward after it. And then when it goes back, it's gonna be a little bit past the going back. So the hat moves, then the feather moves, and the feather moves past the other motion. Does everybody understand? So it's like when you see a comic book hero running with a cape and they stop and the cape swishes past them and then blows back. That's follow through an overlapping action, more or less. Make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay. Another example real quick would be if you've got an arm, I'll just use rectangles for the arm. And then there's your hand. So I'm going to move my anchor points to where they would be on the arm. Move that over there. Then move that there. Let me change the color on that. OK, so. That's the top of my arm, that's the middle. I'm going to parent the middle to the top and then there's my hand, I'll parent that to the middle. This is why I tell you to have multiple layers, like there's the arm, but what would really happen is, move my playhead, snap that there. The arm would swing forward like that and the weight and gravity, the middle part would then start rotating a little bit after the first part, and then it'd go a little bit past it because of that. And then lastly, the hand would be moving in that order, like such. That's another example, of follow through an overlapping action, like that. Make sense? Okay. I'll delete all that. And now we can dive into the new stuff. So first, you don't need to follow along to this part. You simply need to just look at the screen. 
for here. This is Illustrator I'm going to be tackling. And I've got multiple files. OK, here we go. And let me go to layers. And let me go to the next one. And this one. OK. So this will be the same with Photoshop and with Illustrator. Close this one. We don't need to see that one. Come on. OK. For this one, if I bring this file into After Effects, everything that is on a layer will be its own layer in the composition. With this one, same thing. There will be one layer because these are all within that one layer. So everybody see that? So this will come in as one image. And then lastly, okay, that's better at least. Okay. And this is one piece of artwork, but it's like a hundred layers. I animated in each piece of this for like a two second animation. And it took me like eight hours. because so I had to set the anchor point for every layer. So plan out your artwork. If you are only gonna have this piece of lab equipment, it's fine if it's all in one layer. But if you need these buttons to flash or blink, they should be their own layer. Everybody got that? And like this lamp here, if you need it to rotate, that should be its own layer, all right? So think it through and manage your layers because you don't want to have a thousand layers if you only need five. Do you understand? So it's like if these drawers open up, great. They should be their own layer. But you know, if not, you don't need to worry about it. So think through what you're going to do before you start making your artwork. And then you'll be able to know how detailed and how layered your artwork needs to be. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Like I showed you with the arm, you're going to want that separated but I might not need every finger on its own layer. All right. Now I'm going to pick one of those art files that I just showed you. So I'm going to do, let's do this one. All right. This is incredibly important. So I'm going to go very slow and make sure everybody gets it. This is the same for Illustrator and for Photoshop. Okay. I did not work in the HD, um, template for this because I wasn't using it for that type of format. But if I want this to come in properly, I went file, import, file. Okay. It's the same for Photoshop, Illustrator, movie clips, whatever. I'm going to choose the file I want, but import as I'm going to choose composition, retain layer sizes. Does everybody see that? Composition yeah. retain layer sizes. So now when I hit open, I've got my own composition and there's the artwork. And as I said, it's going to come in as one layer because they were all buried in that one layer. So if I go file, import file, and this time I choose the one that I broke down into a billion layers, and this is set up as 1920 by 1080, I go import as. Composition retain layer sizes, and I hit open. And when I double click on that composition, there's all my layers. Okay, everybody see that? So I've got full flexibility. Lastly, this is with Illustrator files only. If you're going to use Illustrator because you're better with the gradients and the tools, every layer you bring in, click this middle gear. I'm in my switches. Remember, toggle switches and modes. If you click it, these are your modes. Click toggle switches and modes again. There's your switches. You want this gear to be on. What that does is no matter how much you scale up your artwork, it'll look crisp and clean. It's continuously rasterizing it. If you don't click that on, your art will start to get blurry and pixelated. Okay. So that's just a little warning if you're going to be working in Illustrator to bring in your <laughs> artwork that way. Um, I have a yes. question. Yeah, name it. Um, that piece of artwork is any particular part of it grouped 
No, they were all separate. And uh, the reason for that, this is this. Let me. This is a quick example of picking your anchor point so you can morph between shapes easily. See how I went from a tablet to a, a palm device, like a, ta a phone? I just set it up and I chose my artwork wisely. Uh, here we go. Here comes the, uh, that. See, that is, you know, why you want total control when you want to do a more complex animation. I'm slowing it down. That was like 100 or 200 layers. Like such. OK, go ahead. All for like one second of animation. I had to move every anchor point, set it up, and animate it in the way you saw, piece by piece by piece. And that's an example of animation hierarchy. I waited, I went from back to front. So it came out the back, went up to the front. Once all this was in, then I started animating in the circles. You want things to be able to build off of other parts. Like I didn't have this stand come in until the bottom part of this drum was animated. Do you understand? It's like, and I went in order. So it looked like stuff was unfolding from each piece. It's all about planning out your motion. We're going to do the easiest thing in motion design, and that's the Ken Burns effect. And I'm going to go to tools, and under size, I'm going to hit large. And uh, I'll just pick this one right here. I'm using the control key to right click. All right, here we go. So I'm just going to drag that into my composition, and I'm going to need to scale it up a little bit because it was a little too small. OK, so does anybody here know who Ken Burns is? No? OK. Ken Burns is basically one of the most famous documentary filmmakers of all time. And the story about him said, Ken Burns could tell you a whole story with just a photograph. So he'd have very limited stuff. And what he would do is he would move his camera over the photograph to tell the story, like slowly moving from side to side, zooming into it, focusing and defocusing, stuff like that drawing your attention to different parts of the photo while telling the story. And it was very beautiful and very artfully done. Well, in After Effects, the Ken Burns effect is the easiest and most requested thing to do. Here's all you have to do. If you want to fake a camera moving across it, you're just going to move the position. But here's my composition right here. You need to fill the frame. You know, like if since I've got nothing else, so that means I'm going to need to scale this up a little bit more. Okay. Now I'm going to go for P for position and I'm going to move my playhead to where I want it to start. And then I'm going to set my photo up to where I want it to begin. It's so like right there, it's covering up the whole screen. And I hit my stopwatch. You only need a minimum of two keyframes for this. So I'm going to go about four seconds and have the cherry tree move a little bit across the screen. Let's see how that looks. Like that. It could even be slower. I just drag that keyframe. You want a nice, slow, soothing motion for the Ken Burns effect. So that means you either don't change the number very much or you spread the keyframes out very far. Does that make sense to everybody? So that would be an example of just panning across the image. I'm gonna click the stopwatch to get rid of that. Scale, same thing. I just move forward and I scale in a little bit. You don't need to go crazy with it. And let's see what that looks like, like that. That's an example of the Ken Burns effect. Slow, soothing motion. Usually just two keyframes. And you either move across the screen, up or down, side to side, or you, know, you can zoom in and out. And that's what it is. Or you could have two photos stacked up and just change the focus between them. You know, it's very simple technique.
Anybody have any questions on the Ken Burns effect? No? Okay. Now we're doing the final new thing of the evening. I'm, I'm shocked with all the technical issues we had. I got through my bulleted notes of what I wanted to cover. All right. I'm going to make a little blade type image here. Okay. If I want this to spin around like a propeller blade, I'd put my anchor point in the middle. Okay. And then this is full number of rotations. So we'll click my stopwatch, move forward, and let's say two full rotations. And here's what you get like that. Okay. So I'm going to get rid of that. And if I wanted it to swing <clears throat> side to side, I put the anchor point at one of the edges and get it to swing like that. Okay. Everybody good? We already know that part. Everyone got it? Yes. Yep. All right. So we're now going to start breaking into two and a half and three dimensions. Right now, this is 2D. Everything is flat. There's no depth. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. Okay. So to go from 2D to two and a half and 3D, you want to be in your switches. These are what the switches look like. Here's your modes. So if you're in modes, just click toggle switches in modes. And all you have to do is for the layer you want to make two and a half or 3D is click on that cube for that layer. Okay. Now watch what's going to happen with rotation and then I'll show you position. So I hit R for rotate and I've got a ton more options than if I was just in 2D. So that's 2D, 3D enable it. So you go, well, what's this all mean? Here's, I can now fold up and down in that direction or in that direction, as well as what you've already had, Z. Do you see how this opens up far more options as an animator? That extra control over the rotation. Does everybody notice it? Yeah. Okay, so position, X, Side to side, Y, up and down, Z. 2D does not have Z. It's got X side to side, Y, up and down. Go 3D, and now you've got Z. Z is further or closer to the camera. Okay, everybody see that? So I'm going to make a star, make it yellow. And I'm going to keep this set. the anchor point at the center. There we go. And I'm going to do a position rotation for this. I mean, a position animation. But I'm going to show you 3D. I'm going to click there. And I'm just going to click position. And I'm going to move forward. Like that. Then I'm going to go over to the side a little bit, up like that. And then finally, say over here. And you go, OK, that looks pretty two-dimensional still. Sure. Now I can start adding Z to it. And you're noticing my star gets smaller the further it goes away. And then when it comes up to the front, I can make it. even bigger to add some extra depth to it. And then as it goes back, I can move it further back like that. See? And you go, okay, well, that's pretty interesting. Now let's see what happens if we add a camera. So I go layer new camera, hit okay. 
that's there. Now let's see what happens. Let me click show my path. Let's see what happens if I orbit the camera a little bit. Now look what's happening. Now we've got that angled bit of depth and you can see it better. Everyone see the difference? Like such. And it becomes even more profound if I add a light into the scene. We're gonna to get to 3D later on. I'm just showing you some of the benefits of that. Light a little stronger. You see, as the light, the image comes into the light, it gets brighter. Let me move that up there. And then I'll make it a little bit brighter. See, like that. Plus, I'm getting shadow. See the difference? I can even tighten up the beam if I want. See that? That's because of the 3D we added in. So I'm just showing you the difference between a 2D and a 3D workflow. Now this is technically two and a half D because 2D is flat, like a sheet of paper. Two and a half D, it's still flat, but you've got stuff that can go nearer or closer to the camera. And that's gonna add some depth, but not thickness. And let me move this up a little bit. Wait, I've got to have another layer. That's right. Okay. See, I can have this closer to the camera and the other one further back. That's two and a half D. It's still flat, but we could add in cameras and have a little bit of depth to the shot. Okay. Now, full on 3D, as you've seen with video games, would look like is that. Maybe we get two and a half D, and then it should be. Oh, I'd have to go into Cinema 4D. Let's see if I crash. We're going to get to Cinema 4D in a couple of weeks, but I'm just showing you what full 3D would look like. Yeah, oh, that's fun. We can't run 3D in here. Nice. So that's what 3D is, you know, an actual cube, okay? So you can do this in After Effects, but that's, like I said, we're not going to be stressing on a full 3D workflow. It's too complex, too time-consuming. So I was just showing you how to make a 2.5 3D layer because you get extra options for your position, as well as rotation. Far more control. So you can have it swinging back and forth like a pet flap on a door where you couldn't do that before if it was just 2D. Everybody understand? Yes. Plus you can, yeah, plus you can angle things and get perspective. All right, excellent. Well, that's all I wanted to go over that was new tonight. Any questions on the Ken Burns effect, two and a half D or overlapping action and follow through <clears throat> um so the, the ken burns effect yes um you, you don't you don't actually move the the image from the screen right you just you're using position and rotation i mean positions in a scale to do that so it's like we're not moving a camera over it, but it looks like you're panning a camera over it. Uh, let me fit this up to the screen a little bit better. So I would say, you know, I get my starting point, move forward, and then I move the image a little bit. So okay. it's a nice, nice slow motion. That's what the Ken Burns effect is. Yeah, I see what I wanted to ask. Because what I, what I what I got was like um, the image you make it at least bigger than the screen yes We're, okay 
Got exactly. It. That's if you want to fill up the frame because it'll look really goofy. But pretend you had a desk underneath this and the photo was on the desk. You don't need the photo to fill up the frame. It's however you want to compose your shot. Do you understand? Yeah. I'm just filling up the frame because I've got nothing else beneath it. That's a great question. Any other questions? And for everyone out there, can you understand me okay with the mask on? Yes. Okay. So I'm trying to enunciate. You sound the same. It's fine. Okay. And like I said, not only do you have each week's lecture I'm going to put up after I'm done, but you also have the recordings I made in advance where I'm not wearing a mask. So you've got two different options. All right. So just one final reminder. When you're in uh, Canvas, simply go to announcements and the first announcement I made, and that's literally every lecture for the entire semester pre-recorded. So if you're going to be sick or you know you can't make it, you could always watch these anytime you want, or you know jump ahead to learn ahead of time. Got it. All right, excellent. Does anybody have anything they want to show me for lab time? Or have any questions about lab or something that inspired you want me to break down something okay so i'm going to go make a yellow square anchor points not important for this i'll make oops. there's a square I'll make a blue circle. And lastly, I'll make a green star. And no, this is not a bowl of Lucky Charms. Okay. That's the star we use because I'm too lazy. Now, with only murders in the building, you saw a lot of camera pushing back and forth, okay? Here's all they did. They had artwork. This could be like the people that were standing in the archway. This is the archway in front of them. That's the uh, building they're looking at, okay? All they did was they just 3D enabled each layer in After Effects, making sure you're in your switches. These are your modes. These are your switches. So they did that, and then they just pushed them back or forth in Z space. So the more you have stuff spread out in Z space, I'll show you this concept real quick. This is called parallax. So I'm going to, all we did was we just spread them out in Z space, just like that shot we saw. And I'm going to add a camera. This is my zoom in, zoom out for the camera. So what they did was zoomed out the camera, then you see the people, you zoom out and there's the archway. That's it, it's a simple camera push in. Once you two and a half or 3D enable your layers, you can get that look. And if you orbit, the spatial relations between the images gets distorted. This is what parallax is. It's kind of like Ken Burns, but in 3D space. Okay, we're gonna cover parallax coming up soon. I'm just showing you when you saw all that stuff, where it looks like the camera's flying through, literally all they did was just spread the stuff out in Z space and move forward and back like that. Very easy to do. And it's, it's very interesting. It's a very powerful animation technique. I'll show you one more use of parallax. Parallax is used a lot in like video games. And when you're doing parallax, whatever's closest to the camera moves fastest and whatever's furthest from the camera moves slowest. So like if someone's walking down the street and the street posts on the other side of the corner are uh, in the front, they'll look like they're moving faster than the trees in the background. That's just a uh, scale up with some texture on the type. Super easy to do. That was the Ken Burns effect on the map. Right there, see? Like I said, even using Hollywood movies. It's like the most used technique. Here we go. Okay, everybody ready?
Watch the rocks. That's parallax. They painted it looking straight on. And as you move the camera, it looks like the spatial relations between the images change. Got it? That's all that is. Parallax. That's all they did. They just lined everything up, pushed it out. And it looks like it changes based upon how the camera moves. But they're all staying in the same spot. Now, I was talking about parallax with motion. Watch the yellow, the green star is going to look like it's moving the fastest. And the yellow square looks like it's moving the slowest. That's parallax. All I'm doing is moving the camera from side to side. Whatever is closest to the camera moves fastest. Whatever is furthest back moves slower to the eye. Everybody see that? Yeah. That's all it is. We're going to go deeper into parallax, but once you master these simple techniques, it's what Hollywood uses. It's what animators across the world use. And I'm showing you them and explaining them to you so that you can try and figure out how you want to use them creatively. That's what my job is. All right. Any questions about any of the stuff we did tonight? Okay. And if anybody's going to stay in the lab and uh, use lab time, I'll be here. But otherwise, uh, if I suggest you all absorb what we went over and think about how you're going to add it into your logo design, you know, position, scale, rotation, transparency, easy ease, squash and stretch, anticipation, overshoot, follow through and overlapping actions. It's, it's just ways of making your motion more interesting. When it's not there, it just looks less polished and less professional, you know. You want to have a good blend of maybe a little bit of extreme motion and then a lot of subtlety. Like you don't want to have too much over the top stuff and, uh, you know, just treat your audience with respect because they're used to seeing a lot of, a lot of stuff. Everybody's been exposed to a wide variety of animation and artwork over the years. So, uh, anyone have anything for lab or no, no one on the screen has anything for lab. You can all just sign off and, uh, Hopefully I'll see everybody in the studio Thursday. Quick reminder, if the weather's going to be bad, you can't, I'll let you know, like if the weather locally is going to be bad, I'll do class virtually, okay? Um, Cause I don't want anyone getting in an accident trying to get to or from school. So I'll keep an eye on the weather. I think it's going to rain Thursday, but I think it's going to stay in the forties. So we'll just monitor that, okay? And everyone check the weather in your area as well. Because like I said, we can keep moving forward virtually whenever the weather prevents us from getting onto campus. All right, perfect. Uh, anyone have anything? Or, you know, if, if, if anyone online is, is done, you know, you can sign off. And I'll just be here in the lab seeing if anybody has anything. As, that... Yes. Yeah, I, I sent you an email. Um, okay. Um, and, yeah, I'm uh, not going to open it up on the screen because I'm screen recording, so I was going to read yeah. it after class. Yeah, and then um, I... I'll put something, I haven't put anything in the, in the folders yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm always going, going through the, 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 um, the past lectures because I didn't um, catch on that quick. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. I, I'm, I'm just glad I had the extra material for you to go over however you want. And uh, just in case anybody learns better with slides. They're in files. Virtual. And there's all my slides and plus like, you know, After Effects files and artwork for you to practice along with. So there's a billion different ways for you to learn this stuff. And I'm open to whatever makes it easier for you to learn. Anyone else have anything? Thank yes. I was going to say thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem at all. Like I said, the, some people teach motion design in a very egotistical way. I try to make it as whittled down and simplified as possible. You know what I mean? Like some people will do this. Make a circle. They'll go, okay, draw a clock. And you go, okay, here's my clock. And I'm just going to center that. I held down command. And I double clicked on there. And they go, okay, we want you to move the second hand in real time. And so 
you'd say, okay, I'll make like a second hand. Like that. And I'll change the color so you can see it. And I'm going to put that right at the center. Because that's where it's going to move from. Like that. And I'll align these. You could always use the align panel for that. So now they're lined up. I got to put that back in the center. So first I'm going to put my circle in the center. I got my second hand. And that's at the center point. Okay. So what some teachers do is they'll say, animate five seconds of the second hand moving. And you'll be like, well, well, what? And they'll want you to do like frame, 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 frame. But it's like, no, what I would just do is I'd open up my composition settings and I'd say, okay, let's make this one minute and hit enter. I like working as quickly and painlessly as possible. So you say, well, why you make that one minute? I'm going to click rotation, go to my minute, and just do one full rotation. So now it's moving like a second hand with just two keyframes instead of 60. Do you understand? Look for the ways of picking up efficiencies, think it through, and strategize. That's what motion design is about. And you notice I'm not going to even change my keyframe interpolation because the second hand is a steady mechanical motion. Got it? That's what it's all about. Because I had people come in from other people's class and they're like, no, we had to do it every second and figure out how many angles to rotate it. And I'm like, no, just do it this way. It's so much easier. Half the problem with motion design, like I said, it's 85% mental. You got to figure it out in your head first, plan it out, and then execute. That's why I have your storyboard. Think about your artwork so you can start saying, how many layers does this need to be? What order should I put everything in? And then you move on to your keyframing. So I encourage everyone to do as much thinking as possible to save yourself a lot of headache. You know, like uh, today at work, um, we're going to be shooting some green screen material. And it's an L-shaped green screen wall where... The back wall is green and the side wall is green. So we're going to have a side camera and a front camera. And I had to figure out how can I make a green screen element that will match both camera shots. And I thought and thought and thought and thought for like an hour and a half. And I tried several things. And I'll show you what the final solution was. I'll use this image. All I did was I said, OK. Here's what the studio looks like. That's the back wall. And I'm like, here's where the corner is going to be. So I duplicated it, made them both 3D. And I just swung this out on the Y 90 degrees. And you go saying, well, what is that going to accomplish? Well, when you add a camera into the scene, I can move this over a little bit. And then I can rotate it. So based upon wherever we have the speaker, I now have an angle that's going to match where they're at. And in addition, I could just throw an effect on it and blur it a little bit because it's going to be further away than the back wall. Like such. And that was all I had to do. But I sat around and I thought about it for a pretty long time. That's all it was. And I was done. Everyone get it? It's like, I didn't even have to go into a 3D program and create a curve of the image. Like if the person's saying here, this will be at a different angle. And it's going to look like it should when the camera switches between the two people. Like there's your straight on. And there's your side shot. 
and it's it's got the blur on it because it'd be further away from the camera. Once you can troubleshoot, then your motion design will come along much faster and more easily. It's, it's like what half of it is, is just trying to figure out how to get it to work. And the best place to start, position, scale, rotation, transparency. Should it be two and a half D or three D enabled or just straight on, you know, and that, that'll help with most of your issues. Okay, so uh, that's it for now. Um, anybody on there have anything else? All right, excellent. Well, if you want, I'll stop the recording so I can start converting it and all that and uh, upload it for myself right. to edit down for everybody. All right, well, thank you all tonight. And anybody in lab, you can stay, you know, for the lab time if you want to get some work done or something like that. I'll be here, answer any questions or look at your artwork or whatever. All right, have a great evening and I'll see everyone here Thursday. They can make it Thursday. And I'm going to try and use my own laptop Thursday and use the ethernet port on the back of the computer because I couldn't get the Wi-Fi password working. So if that's the case, then we'll, we'll go much faster and I'll just be using my streaming software. So it'll go a little bit smoother. All right, excellent. Well, I hope everyone has a great evening. Stay safe and warm out there. And uh, I'll see you all Thursday if you can make it into the class. And if not, just hop on the stream. All right, have all right. a great evening.